What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of Black and Gold Brothers Podcast. He is CJ. I am Chad Brown, and we're here to chop it up about Colorado Buffaloes, my man. But before we dive into the rest of the Big 12 schedule, give predictions, all that kind of stuff, see if uh, Coach Prime can deliver Miss Peggy her bowl game, all the promises that have come with this season. You and I were getting ready for the show. You sent over a text said the gospel, according to Mac, was on ESPN again today. Um, it's one of those things, like one of my favorite movies. Yeah. And I'm flipping through channels and it comes on. It's like, oh, well, shit, I got to sit down and watch this for a while. So I guess you got caught up in that again this morning. Man, I, I'm, I'm, you know, just sending out emails in my my little office at the crib. And I am, uh, get a call from a friend in Vegas. It's like... Dude, I'm looking at you on TV. I'm like, what are you talking about? The Gospel According to Mac is on. And uh, for the, for those who don't know, The Gospel According to Mac is a 30 for 30 feature that was produced, I think, in 2015. And uh, Hawk, Hawk Films out of New York did the actual production of it. But it was it's part of the 30 for 30 franchise. Chad. Just, just real quick, real quick. Were you involved in the production or were you the talent wrangler? I know you were involved in some way, but I'd love to get the details on that. So so take let's go back to 2014 mm -hmm. when um, if Survive in Advance, the story of Jim Valvano and the North Carolina State Wolfpack. Right. That was the 30 for 30, the big 30 for 30 that was released in 2014. Um. Oh, Derek Wittenberg. Yes, yeah, there we go. Yep. D. Witt. So D. Witt is the point guard for, of course, Jim Valvano's team. He was the one of the featured individuals in the 30 for 30. Well, he was the assistant men's basketball coach at CU in the early 90s. So Derek and I struck up a great friendship. He was the executive producer of his 30 for 30. While he was doing his 30 for 30, the producers of that show, Hawk Films out of New York, asked, given his time in Boulder, if he had any connections to the CU football program because they had an interest in this story. And so they, I'm in a barbershop. I'll never forget. He calls me. He's like, CJ, man, listen, and, and tells me what they want. So they fly me out to New York and began to sort of lay out what the story might look like. And Chad, that was the beginning of it. And so I would fly out to New York. I think I flew out three times over the course of uh, over the course of almost a year, maybe 10 months. Uh, took them that long to do it. And I'll be honest with you, there were some there were some tense moments about the production that because one of the things I was absolutely adamant about is we can't there's no way this could think about the title, the gospel according to Mac. So you knew that there would be some degree of controversy or you know it, it would be polarizing to some because they had it had such a heavy religious tone to it but i said there's no way we're going to portray this guy in any negative light and so um they made sure of that and everything that was ultimately produced was uh about coach mccartney was green lighted although i tell you it was uh you know it, it was accurate the story was told accurately, but as you know, depending on who the storyteller is, can determine whether or not it's. So it it was uh, there was a lot behind the scenes. It was it, it became a very heavy endeavor for me um, because I was so concerned about how my teammates and coaches, the program itself, could be portrayed if this thing wasn't done done right. Well, you know, while you and I got lots of jokes for each other. Um, here, here we go. Another shout out to CJ, man. You're, I can't think of another Buffalo who would have been better to be at the tip of the spear for this project and to be able to tell the story as, as accurately and as honestly as you did, because, you know, the time for coach Mack was not all puppies and rainbows. That's right. Um, and the public perception of him and the program and some of the religiosity uh, that he, you know, wears very proudly, um, created controversy, particularly right. in a place like Boulder. So uh, the storyline, which you could not make up, even if you were drawn up a movie, because everyone would say this is completely unbelievable, was true. That is the story that we lived as Colorado Buffaloes at that time. And uh, I'm incredibly proud 
of the portrayal um, that you and those folks out there in New York were able to put together and tell the story um, that almost everyone around the country who was a football fan at the time knew pieces and parts, but did not have the full spectrum of it. So I thought it did a tremendous job of, of telling what we lived and really what produced that national championship were all those difficult, hard, emotional, uh, doubtful moments that toughened us um, on the football field and toughened us as men as well. Chad, I'm going to tell you, man, it was, um, you, you know, when I, and every time I watch it, I've probably seen it four or five times. Every time I watch it, there's a different angle or piece to our history at CU that, that comes to light. But in a lot of ways, um, if you think about how unique, and it's hard, when you're that age, you kind of assume that your peers at other schools are experiencing similar, similar, if not the same things, right? We're just living in the moment and what happens, happens. But then to take a look back at it, the way uh, the gospel according to Max sort of chronicles it and puts it together in a story form, it is fascinating. Like the ebbs and flows, the, the life lessons on and off the field, Chad, that, um, that we dealt with, with such a unique, uh, and I think an amazing figure like Bill McCartney at the, at the helm, um, our experience was unique. For as common as it was in some ways as student athletes on a college football campus, in a lot of ways it was unique. The whole story around Sal and Essie is to your point, it's like Hollywood can't really make this up, right? No one would believe it. It would, you know, it'd be sort of a flighty story if they tried, right? No one would believe it. Um, the relationship with Christy, uh, the production, you know, having a baby, um, right at the time when he is, you know, he's been diagnosed with cancer. I mean, all these elements to it that were, that were just, you know, just very unique in their own right. So it, it's, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal story and look into the life of uh, Bill McCartney. But when I tell you this, Jet, when I, when I captured it today, it was on the piece where we were all in Coach Mack's basement. I think it was me, you, the enemy, Hagen, Dion Figures, Leonard Renfro, uh, Alfred Williams. I don't. I think Al was there. Yeah, I think he was there. But at any rate, we're in there, and you're telling a story about how Coach Mack, and you've shared it on this show, challenged your love for the game, challenged your manhood. Mm -hmm. And for all the emotional pieces of that story, it choked me up again, just watching it this morning. I'm like, because you got choked up telling the story. Yep. And I'm like, damn it, Chad, stop <laughs> crying. Like, stop. Right. So you got choked up telling the story. And I this morning, I'm sitting in my chair like, oh, my God, I had to freeze and I got choked up. I had to snap out of it. Right. And um, but it, it's such a richly deep emotional story. I mean, these are all of us grown men at this point with kids. Hell, you just you just uh, just had a, paid a lot of money for a wedding for your beautiful yep. bride, daughter. And so, <laughs> so but it, it was just such a that piece was so if you haven't seen it, folks, you got to go check yep. out the gospel according to Mac. And this part where Chad actually spills his heart about how that challenge from Coach Mack made you feel was just so real. And then you went out the next game and I think had over 20 tackles against Texas in what was a crazy game in and of itself. Yeah, it was, it was one of those precipice moments for me. Um, you know, as, as a young person, things get hard in life. Our, our instant reaction is not to dive deeper into self and try to pull something deeper out of yourself. It's to feel sorry for yourself. And that season wasn't going so great on the field. Um, I was struggling a bit and what was being asked to me on the field and uh, all that feeling sorry for myself and trying to look around and cast blame on other people. Coach Mack did what the leaders did. He appealed to me in a way where I had no place to hide. Yeah. No place to hide. And um, clearly you can hear the emotion in my voice still chokes me up to this day. Um, I don't think I looked back as a CU football player after that particular moment. That call out was Friday at the 
college in before we got on the buses to head to Texas. So we were one, one and one. Um, Coach Mack had a bit of bit of a, you know, for lack of better phrasing here, particularly the gospel according to Mack, a come to Jesus meeting with the entire football team. <laughs> and I was not the only one called out. Um, but the fact that he saved me for last and told me, you hurt me the most. Mm. 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 Here's this man who, you know, sat on my mom and dad's couch and told them I'm going to be like a father to Chad, telling my dad this, and, you know, my parents' house in Altadena, California. So now my father is calling me out and telling me, you've hurt me the most. Wow. Um, yeah. Yeah. And the entire room looks at me, what could Chad have done? And then, yeah, he questioned my football heart, my football character, and how much I love the game and how much I was willing to give. All right, man, I'll show you. So, yeah, the next night, what, you know, a little bit more than 24 hours later, 20 plus tackles, the Buffs get a win. Um, and then that season unfolds with a national championship. In the so, rest of history, as they say, right, Chad? And yes, and that is history, absolutely. So, Coach Mack had a unique way of seeing and seeing more in people than they could see in themselves. And I think that was his way, as I'm listening to you and how you internalized and received that particular criticism, because for some, that could have that could have ruined the day. That could have really um, hurt someone's ability to to rebound. It could have done a man. Uh, but he knew that you had the metal in you to receive that level of cr criticism because it was going to bring the best out in you, Chad. And uh, I think that was one of uh, Bill McCartney's uh, uh, superpowers, if you will. Uh, he will look you in your eye and challenge you in ways that you're thinking this is fight or flight It's put them up and and there were times when it didn't always go so smooth with some guys right but it was uh it really was a it was a threshold as you phrase it come to jesus moment he had an ability to have those moments with individual players yeah so um I, I actually went and saw coach mack a couple of months back he's at a mental care facility right outside of boulder and, um, you know, father time is undefeated. And so the uh, mental decline, unfortunately, is is there. But uh, you can still see the spark in the eyes. And as I was telling some stories to him, you can still see some recognition in him. Yeah. Um, so it was a very, you know, kind of heartwarming moment to be able to bring some, some joy to him. Um, this man who literally, as he explained to my parents, Chad coming to see you is going to be the springboard for the rest of his life. Yeah. And um, I met my wife at CU. Both of my kids are graduates from the University of Colorado. I got a job in my chosen profession. We won four Big A titles. We won a national championship. Um, you're going to be all Big A, Chad, and you're going to be all American. Every piece of that shit came true. He told me <laughs> that was going to happen, and every piece of it came true. So I'm not sure if there's a better advertisement for Coach Mack or for the University of Colorado than than that little snippet of my yeah. life right there. That was that was special, man. That, no wonder they call it the gospel. Oh, according yes. to Mac, right? yeah. It could be a gospel according to Chad, the gospel according to C. I mean, it was uh he he was prophetic in that way, man. And he, he just had a he had a, a unique, uncanny ability to just look into your soul and challenge you, just challenge you in the moment and um and bring the best out in most. Yeah, yeah. Wow, uh, more emotional. All right, but I didn't mean to get you. See, now you're starting to get off. I need some damn tissue, man. Now, now you're starting to do this. Stop, Chad. I, oh, I'm, I'm sensitive, man. man. Goodness. I'm sensitive. I'm sensitive. All right, now that we've dealt with the emotional part of the show, uh, this year's current Colorado Buffaloes, not the 1990 Colorado Buffaloes. We're going to be saying some tears. We're going to be saying some tears at the end of this season, too. <laughs> yeah, baby. Tears of joy. Mm -hmm. Hey, man, we find ourselves four and one. Right now, at this moment, we are fourth in the Big 12 standings. Um, so we've gotten past what I think is the controversial part of the season where the focus was less on what was happening on the field and more about yeah. words that Coach Prime said at a press conference. Or yeah, with rain, rain, 30% is 30, 70% it won't. Let's do drills that, that say it won't rain. Now we find ourselves in the heart, in the heart of the Big 12 schedule. So later on this week, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into Kansas State. But looking at the rest of the Big 12 schedule, 
this is the only game left, seven games left. Well, I'm going to go ahead and chalk up eight because we're going to get to a bowl game. Uh, we're going to get six wins, become bowl eligible. This is the only game coming up that the Buffs are not favorites. They have put themselves in a position in a conference where there's some teams that were expected to be much better, but are underperforming a bit, where a conference championship does not seem impossible, where just getting to a bowl game seems to be the bottom level of what, what the expectation should be, that we should actually be aiming higher for this football team to go this year. No, I, listen, I totally agree. Although I like the mindset of take, this is a one game at a time proposition. I looked through this schedule pretty intensely last night, just projecting. And I, it, it occurs to me that every team on the schedule still we're capable of beating. Mm-hmm. And I will also go as far as to say every team on the schedule is capable of beating us too, right? There are no automatics on this schedule. But being the optimist that I am, I'm looking at it as the cup being half full. We're five and a half, I think the five and a half point dog to K-State. Uh, people looked at this game, I think, at the beginning of the season and thought, you know, let's figure out what the first five looked like because that K-State game is likely not to go our way. I, here's what I like about where CU is right now. We'll get more into like the, the schedule itself in the second hit chat, but here's what I like about it. We are a team, a program, I believe that's ascending, still really haven't quite hit its mark yet, but finding ways to win games as it's actually getting better as a team. Um, And so every Saturday is sort of a, it's a referendum on the progression that the team has made week over week. And we've seen it, right? And, And let's say the progress that we made from game one through the season, save for Nebraska, each week, we've seen a little bit more, a little bit more of the team's personality, a little bit more of, of who they are, who they ultimately going to be or what their capability, what they're capable of being is. We've seen them marching in that direction. I like that for this program because I think every other team on the program, for the most part, came in. This is who they are. CU was the mystery team. We were the wild, we were the wild card team in this conference. Um with two of the best players in the country, I think the best wide receiver room in the country, a defense that is underappreciated uh, and not given the credit it's due, uh, and an offensive line that's beginning to sort of, an offensive system, I should say, that's beginning to sort of show some light uh, with, with some success in the running game. I'm feeling good about it, Chad, and I just think us being, the Buffs being on an ascending sort of trajectory, and everybody else, just who they are. It's a matter of not whether or not the better teams in the conference, we're sending fast enough to catch up with them. I'm looking at some of the teams out there, and then we'll go through it. And I'm saying, huh, okay. That 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 team factor to be in the thick of national talk, not necessarily panning out that way. We got a shot. All right, before you got me all choked up, uh, <laughs> I was supposed to give a shout out to our sponsor, Journey Spice. And then in Rosette, Journey Smites, they do a tremendous job. Got my package, by the way, baby. Nice. Got my package. It's, it's on and cracking. Very, hey, I love the package, too. Yeah, the, the packaging's fantastic. No plastic. Plastic out, flavor in. Uh, the Kansas City Barbecue Rub, I have yet to get my hands on that one. So looking forward to that. Uh, there's several favorites of the current crop. The Moroccan Spice Rub is fantastic. The Greek Citrus. On some, on some fish or shellfish is off the freaking chart. So, yes, before this season is over, you and I will have to uh, sample each other's uh, Journey Spice product. Meat. That's right. Yes, so looking forward to that. Make sure you hit up Journey Spice on Amazon.com. Use the code 20 Field Goal to get 20% off of your order for Journey Spice. So uh, let's keep, <laughs> keep the podcast going. All right, man, so I will echo what you just said about this football team. Um, we've seen – this has been a really fun year of football. We got in the NFL, Kansas City Chiefs, not hit their stride yet, yet they're finding ways to win games. This last weekend of college football, maybe one of the most banana weekends I've ever seen. Banana. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had that Missouri game, um, and I, you know Missouri was a top-10 football team, had not played anybody, got whooped up by Texas A&M. So Texas A&M is who everyone thought they would be. Missouri is the paper Tigers, not the real Tigers. So, yes, we deserve to win that fifth down game. Uh, 
<laughs> hey, Alabama gets yeah, 30, upset. 30, 34 years ago yesterday. Was 34 years ago yesterday. <laughs> the anniversary of the 34th anniversary of the fifth down game. At wow. Wow. That was 34 October years 6th. ago. Yep. Just, just, just a, a quick question for you on that. Did you know it was fifth down on the field? No. What did he say? <laughs> no, you had no idea. And the only person I think knew was Jay Lewinberg. Well, Jay's a school teacher. He's a smart dude. He's, he's, he's probably the smartest guy on the team, right? The, right. the offensive lineman always smart guys. But Jay, Jay tried to tell me, CJ, we, you know, we, we had a three-play series that we were going to run at the end of the game. We had already run two plays. This has been a drive with a second team quarterback, and I'm not sure in a in a situation like this where how many second team quarterbacks could actually take their team down the field. And, and it wasn't like he was pitching the ball all the time. He made big plays on this drive. I said, guys, listen, Geronimo, so if, we, if, B, if EB don't score on this play, you got to get up and get set so I can kill the clock because we didn't have any more timeouts. The strategy session on the sideline, a meeting of the minds. He said, CJ, you can't. He was trying to tell me you can't do it. We're like right before the ref brings us out of the huddle. He said, CJ, we can't do that. And as soon as he said that, I tried to entertain him for a second, but the ref said, bring him out, Johnson. He did a good job last week when Hagan came out with the sprained shoulder, marching him downfield against Washington late in the game. I said, shut the hell up, Jay. What are you talking about? Geronimo. You're football shoulder. to play, man. <laughs> Second down, one yard. The enemy stacked up. I don't think he's in. Got to hurry. The clock at 10 seconds right now. Got to hurry. The Buffs have no timeouts left. They stopped the clock to unpile everybody. Eight seconds to go. You might want to throw it in the ground here. Six, five, four. That's what Johnson does. Stops the clock with two seconds left. And uh, yeah, he was the only one that I'm I'm certain who knew that it was fifth down. It's funny looking at the TV copy. All the TV people seem to seem to have known, right? Everyone right. who's watching the game. Uh, spectators, not everyone, but they, you know, the TV folks and the radio people knew. They were like, oh, my God, we just spiked it on fourth down. Three running backs behind Johnson. Johnson himself, is he in? Yes. The oh, Bucks my goodness. The ball game. Look out. They're all over the field. The fans are streaming onto the field as if Missouri won. Oh, my goodness. And yet on the other sideline, <laughs> the CU Buff team is running onto the field as if they won. But I didn't know. I had no idea. There was some murmuring on the sideline, but, you know, I, I had no real idea either. But uh, I'm still glad it all happened. And, again, the, the football gods and football karma – they tried to cheat us with that uh, with that early version of field turf. Did not properly address the field, so uh, it's funny how life works when you try to cheat somebody. So as much as Missouri wants to cry, y'all, you guys created this whole situation here. All right, yes, but this football team, man, going in the right direction. Um, more and more talent on the offensive side is revealing itself. Yeah. Um, every week, I, I think Pat Shermer finds another player to get included in, in the offensive production. The offensive line continues to come together. Jordan Seaton is getting national acclaim for being the, the, one of the best freshman offensive linemen in the country, a guy who's showing to be who we thought he would be. And then defensively, uh, players are beginning to emerge rather than just a kind of a, a CU defense as a, as a pack of here's a defense that's getting better. We've got linebackers who are stepping forward, becoming physical players. We've got DBs other than Travis Hunter who are going to be drafted and go in the draft this year. So the overall direction of the program is certainly pointed up. But I, I like the way in which they are winning games, yet checking off boxes almost every single week. Run game's an issue. Well, we'll, we'll do better this week. Offensive line, we got a little uh, – had some issues the week before. We'll check that box and be better this week. That's what the best football teams do. You know, as we start this – podcast today we talked about the gospel according to mac which is the culmination of that is that 1990 national championship season and we started one one and one but we found ways to get better all season long that's what the best teams do that, that's exactly right and uh, i think mac in 1990 and in, in that era was credited with having you look at his coaching tree and how many went off to be head coaches uh in college football and elsewhere he was credited in putting together great coaching staff and he did I think one of the criticisms, if not subtle, of Dion is that he didn't know what he was doing from a coaching perspective. 
And to the extent that this team is successful after five games and what happens here, here on will be and is a testament to his coaching staff. I think last year, you know, it was, you talk about mercenaries, right? I think the staff itself, Dion coming, not having deep roots in the game where you have these long established relationships and coaching of people that you work with. A lot of what he did last year was recommendations from others on who should be. Of course, you can have competence, but no chemistry. And it seemed like it was just disjointed. Year two, and I, I, I liken his the picking of his staff to sort of his maturation as a head coach. We're seeing a better version of a staff the composition of it, we're seeing a better version of Coach Prime as a coach on game day in and of itself. Uh, and I'm glad that I think a lot of the criticism was absent of the grace of like, wow, you know, this guy is, this is a new, he's turned over a new stone here. This is new. Let's give him time to see, you know, what, what works out or how this thing unfolds. I don't think there was that, from a media perspective, that sort of grace period for a guy uh, in terms of on the field stuff, but we're beginning to see the fruit of his maturation process or maturing as a coach in himself and in his staff, I believe, Chad. I would agree with that. I think when you become a first year coach at a university, the staff the next year, there's going to be tremendous turnover because you're going to figure out who's ready for the fire, who's ready to implement your plan, who is somebody that you can spend 18 hours a day with, um, all those pieces of the puzzle. Last year, defensive coordinator, you know, released before the season was over. Uh, you know, Sean Lewis was demoted from play calling. Pat Shermer took over late in the season. So the two most important positions on the staff, offense and defensive coordinator, clearly there was not a match for what the Buffs were trying to do on the field, nor were they a match for what the vision that Coach Prime had. At this point, it seems like Pat Shermer has provided balance to an offense that desperately needed that. And then Coach Livingston on defense has found a way every week to – tweak the, the, the defensive scheme and tweak the personnel for a, an improving performance every single week. So last year, by this point, things were starting to go downhill. This year, at this point, the arrows point up and things are looking better every single week. Yeah. Yeah. And and not to and, and you, we can add to the to that the fact that you turned the whole roster over pretty much. Yeah. So and, and you were and you were coming from a team, you you were coming into a team that was at the bottom of the barrel, college football. I mean, you add all those factors in. What's a what's more amazing, to be honest with you, is that we're four and one right now. If you really kind of focus out and see where this program was two seasons ago, not ten seasons ago, or even five, two, two, mm -hmm. we were dead to rights, and to see. Where we are today, I don't think we give credit to to what it took to get us here. And you know, there's been some good fortune. We got great players. We got a number of great players. Now we're beginning, I think, to see it come together, Chad. And again, I, I'm I'm thinking where others have been, you know, prove it, prime. We don't believe you. I'm like, man, this is pretty darn amazing that. We are where we are. Again, there's a lot of meat left on this bone in this 2024 season. I don't want to get ahead of my skis, but I think it's fair to, to say, given where we came from, this has been a damn phenomenal job, man. Chad, you could just say, yep, you're right. You could just say that. Yeah, you look, I know. I'm, no, I'm jumping on, I'm jumping, I'm fully piggybacking off that point. There, a couple of years ago, I had conversations with people that I'm not sure CU has a football program mm. in five years. Mm. That if we get a good coach, he's going to get plucked away. There's not enough money at, in the budget to keep a good coach for any length of time. Um, this football team has slid so far nationally as far as recruiting. The, the glory days of my time will never, ever come back. And why would CU continue to literally ram their head against a brick wall when there can be no possible progress on the horizon. And now, again, we're fourth in the Big 12. Uh, we're outside the top 25. We're not ranked just yet. I believe that will be coming. Um, but things are definitely pointed in the right direction. 
let's uh, let's go over quickly uh, the next seven games and what we think of uh, the bus chances as we finish out the Big 12 schedule here. So next coming up this Saturday, and you and I will do a podcast kind of previewing this game against Kansas State. This is the one game from an ESPN matchup perspective where the Buffs are not winning the matchup. Um, it's going to be a tough one for the Buffs. How do you think this one will play out? I, you know, I'll give my prediction later, Chad. I got, you know, I like to take in data. I'm about data. Right. There's a lot that's going to happen between today and kickoff. So when we have our pre kickoff show, after accumulating all that rich data that I know is coming my way in part due to X's tremendous uh, uh, journalism, X, you the man. Uh, hey, hey, bro, what would we be without X, man? We'd just be two dudes talking to each other on the phone. <laughs> Hanging up on each other, set yeah. up. Uh, but but at any rate, we um, I, I'll give my prediction later. But here's what I'd say: I, I, I like I'm liking the matchup. I did a little research on Kansas State. They had a tough game at Tulane where they escaped. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that game was played down in in New Orleans, but they escaped and got away with the victory there. Uh, the one blemish on their schedule is uh, it was a surprise. Who did they lose? BYU. To? BYU got got beaten up pretty bad. And by what by the way, BYU are beating a lot of people up. Pretty, mm-hmm. pretty good these days. Um, got beaten up by BYU. I was kind of surprised at that. Um, we have a shot against this team. This is one of those. This is one of those games where I think, it, see, you could match up well against them if our eyes are telling us the truth about how much better our front seven on defense have gotten. If, yeah. we, if we can neutralize the line of scrimmage, we don't have to win it. We just neutralize the line of scrimmage because K-State is a pound. They're kind of like Utah. Um, not quite Nebraska because I don't think they have the quarterback with that type of skill set. But they like to demand or command the line of scrimmage on both sides and just kind of beat you in fundamental football. Um, if we can neutralize and play them at least even up front on both sides, I think this game bodes well. It matches up well for CU. Shut up. Yeah, I, I, th- I think it's a definitely a winnable game. Um, it's going to be a close game, in my opinion. I think Kansas State will present uh, a front that's going to be similar to Nebraska, but also they got more skill on the outside than what Nebraska had. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I guess we'll yeah we'll kick that prediction can down the road a bit. Uh, then after that, we've got Arizona. Um, Arizona, you know, off they got off to a, a decent start to this season. <laughs> And then uh, stumbled here the last couple of weeks. They lost to Kansas State 31-7. And they lost this last week uh, 28-22 to Texas Tech. But they did beat a Utah football team. Yeah. So, and Utah's pretty good as well. So, I think Arizona, they're looking to, you know, get an upset against BYU this weekend and to come into the matchup against Colorado with some momentum. So, uh, I, I think it's a bit early to, to write off this Arizona team and where they are. No, you and again, like I said at the from the very onset, this is one of this is a conference where anything can happen. You just mentioned Arizona beat Utah, who was the odds on favor to win the conference, like mm-hmm. many had in the top 10 in the country, and then lose to Texas Tech. That's that's what this conference I think brings. There are no surprises from week to week. I can't think of a team that I would be shocked if that team, you know, I, there's not a win on this schedule, I think, in the Big 12 conference that would shock me. Um, and so that mm-hmm. uh, it's just it's just one of those let's play it out type deals. And again, what gives me optimism given that is is like if you have the best quarterback on the field, sometimes that's the tiebreaker, even mm-hmm. when you may not be as good everywhere else. Uh, so, uh, you know, again, I'm, I'm kind of liking where CU is, but you're right. Arizona is, and that, that game is down there in, in Tucson. Correct. Quarterback. Is it Fafita, Fafita or something like, I can't, I don't know. It's one of those. It's not like some of those names you had to pronounce when you were doing games. Fafita. Yes. Fafita. Yes. Mm-hmm. So good, good little football player there too. Pretty dynamic yeah. guy. So. Yeah. He's had a pretty good season. Seven touchdowns. No, the six interceptions can clean up. Cincinnati's after Arizona. Um, Cincinnati's kind of in the middle of the pack of the conference right now, one and one in conference play, three and two overall. But they did just put uh, up 44 points against, I'm sorry, 41 points against Texas Tech. So they've got some explosive nature to their offense as well. So one of those teams that could possibly go point for point 
with the Buffs offense if CU's defense does not show up? I think that's a big game. I think, and it not necessarily because Cincinnati is a world beater, but I think that's the next home game. You have Kansas State at home this this week. Um, this is a 50-50 game. Uh, you're on the road at Arizona, a winnable game to be sure. But the, the Cincinnati's of the world, when you have them at home, that's the pressure game. That's the game you just got to win, right? You got to win that football game because I think regardless of what happened in the previous two, that one right there is going to be, could play it prove to be extremely pivotal in, in what's what, you know, what one might forecast for this team moving forward. Then as a buy, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I know we got Texas Tech after Cincinnati. What's the what's the flow of the schedule? The ninth. I think that's yeah. the we have, we have a second bye after Cincinnati. Then we go play Texas Tech. Now, Texas Tech is up top the Big 12 standings right now with three conference wins. They're five and one. They've beaten Arizona State. They won their last four games. Now, Texas Tech is putting together a pretty good season. They got a, a win against Cincinnati, and then they beat Arizona this past weekend. So, uh, Texas Tech's not currently ranked. But maybe by the time these teams get together, they could be. Um, do, do you have the schedule up there, Chad? Yeah, I do. Texas Tech. Who do they? Who they? Who are the six teams they played or five teams they played? All right. So the the the, the start of the season was against Abilene Christian, uh, then Washington State. That was their one loss for the season. Then they got a big win over North Texas. Then the last three have been, like I said, Big Twelve games: Arizona State with the win, Cincinnati with the win, and then Arizona with the win this last weekend. Did you say they had a big win against North Texas? 66-21. I mean, that's... Oh, oh, big in terms of points. Okay, okay. That's what I said. I didn't realize that was an in-state rival for Texas. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then after Texas Tech, we got Utah. And Utah's a bit of a... You know, they've dominated the Buffs for years and years since they first joined the Pac-12 together. Uh, gosh, what was that, 10 years ago, 12 years ago? Something like that. Yeah. Right. That's well, yeah. And Kyle Whittingham has put together a really good program there. They don't bring a lot of four and five star recruits in, but they turn two and three star recruits into really, really good football players. Um, here locally in Denver, uh, the Broncos have got uh, Jonah Ellis. That's right. A young defensive end. Pops played with the Broncos. Um, he's definitely one of the rookie stars for the Broncos. Devon Vele, wide receiver from Utah. Uh, they bring these kids in who may be uh, under-recruited, but they have a developmental part of their program where they coach these kids up. They get them in the weight room, and by this time these kids leave, they got some really good football players. So that's going to be a tough game for the Buffs, particularly up front on the offense and defensive lines. You can count on one hand the number of coaches in college football, and you probably don't need every finger, who have done a better job than Kyle Whittingham at Utah. He is he is at the very top over the last 10 years, right? He's wow. at the very top of uh, head coaches in college football, given what he's done with their what they've done with their respective programs. The guy's been amazing. Now, here's the interesting, interesting thing about Utah. It seemed to be a little bit more. They're not as consistent this year as they've been in the past. It's a little more feast or famine. They're not scoring points the way they could. They would in the past. We've just seen them dominate you at the point of attack and just wear you down. We're not seeing them doing that, do that as consistently this year as we've seen in the past. And uh, what was the quarterback's Papa? I call him Papa because it feels like he's been playing college football for 15 years, man. <laughs> he has low, who's the quarterback for Utah, man, who's been – Cam oh, Rising. Rising, yes. Yeah, Papa. Mm -hmm. He's been around for – he's got to be 36 years old. I don't know how many damn college games he played, how many years of eligibility he's gotten. But he when when he's healthy, it's pretty darn good football. I mean, he he can add an, an element. He's not the he's not the the sexiest quarterback in terms of his ability to play, but he's a he's a good football player and a winner. And uh, again, he's he's been around for he's played college football for as long as you played in the NFL, Chad. <laughs> damn near, damn near. <laughs> Uh, after Utah, we've got Kansas. And Kansas was one of those teams that they were a preseason top 25 football team, yet they find themselves one and five right now. Looks like uh, the, you know, the ground is just disappearing from underneath Kansas. They opened up with a win against Linwood, and it's been five losses since then. Illinois lost, UNLV lost, West Virginia lost, TCU lost, and last week 
to Arizona State, 35-31. So uh, I'm going to chalk that one up. I know we're not giving predictions right now. It's an easy win for the Buffs uh, based off where Kansas program and the direction and trajectory of what they're doing on the football field. No, I'm with you. And uh, I know they had some injuries at the quarterback position early on at quarterback. I think it's Daniels. He's pretty, uh, pretty good football player. But I'm with you. You know, a lot of times, Chad, it's and, and we we experienced this. The chasing it is a lot. It's a whole different ball game than than maintaining it when you have when there's expectations attached. Yeah. Um, some programs just aren't cut out for that. Right. The chase is always where the energy is when you are when people. OK, you're top 25. OK, let's see if that's true. And people start coming at you. Uh, Kansas seems to be one of those programs that just can't sustain that level of success because it's not, I don't know, it's just not part of the DNA. They've yeah. had some good programs, but uh, that's tough to to when the expectations are there to, to be able to consistently rise to the occasion. Then the Buffs will finish the regular season with Oklahoma State Cowboys, which got off to a hot start. We're a ranked football team with three wins to start the season. And then the last three weeks in Big 12 play, lost to Utah, lost to Kansas State, and a loss to West Virginia. Um, there's discussions out there. Ollie Gordon, the probably the top two college running back, he may sit out the rest of the season. His draft stock is pretty well solidified, so it'll be interesting to see how all that plays out. But uh, Oklahoma State's definitely struggling right now. There's certainly, certainly time for them to turn things around, but – doesn't feel very likely. There seems to be a dark cloud over that program right now. I agree with you. And, um, you know, in an odd way, Chad, Oklahoma State is one of the programs that I like least. Um, <laughs> there's something about that program that, you know, you, you, had all, you got all the T-Boone Pickens money. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the, you know, Gundy's been there forever. I'm not a Gundy, probably because I'm just not a Gundy fan at all. Don't like them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I won't go into specifically why, but it had something to do when, when they came and played here at Colorado uh, back in the, in the late 80s. And um, he, I don't think he's a good person, some of the things that came out of his mouth in that game. Mm -hmm. But um, I, maybe, the, maybe the, the bloom was coming off that rose a little bit, right? They've been consistent. They've never gotten to the mountaintop, but they've been a consistently good program. And for whatever reason, um, it's not happened. It's not happening this year. It would do my heart well if they just didn't win any more games. <laughs> I'll just, just be honest with you. <laughs> well, I, I don't want to discuss the, the six games before they get to the Buffs, but yeah, I expect the Buffs to find a way to win that game as well. So I guess optimistically, we're looking at the rest of the Big 12 schedule with our, our black and gold glasses on. Things look pretty good. A bowl game almost seems to be assured uh it would have to be some pretty dramatic injuries or some kind of situation up there in boulder where that wouldn't be a possibility but i said that seems to be the bottom of my expectations I, i'm looking at this team to compete for a big 12 championship here in year two with coach Brown. Woo! Woo! did you just say that i just said that hold on chat wait now see now, now there you go you you got to give me some kind of warning. We talked before the show. You could have told me you was going to come with come with that, so I could have been prepared for it. <laughs> wow! Listen, I'm not disagreeing with you necessarily. I'm just not saying. When you start saying things like that, you got to kind of reel it in and say, "Okay, who do we have Saturday? Let's just get through Saturday, right? right? Because, but, but I, I agree in that. Given what I said, they, there's no one on the schedule that I'm afraid of. If you're a buff, you're not afraid of anyone on the schedule. There's not a game on it that you will say, man, I don't know that we can, I don't know if we can win that game. That game doesn't exist anymore on the schedule to date. And so is it possible? Yes. But damn, Chad, you talk about a brother who go from one extreme to another one three weeks ago when he was talking about how horrible everything, everything was. The Nebraska loss was horrible and it created doubt. And I, I'm not judging this program, you know, just strictly through my black and gold glasses. I'm judging on what I see on the football field. They were dominating. Yeah. But here's, but here's the difference, Chad. Here's the difference. Like, after the Nebraska game, I said, man, that was a turd sandwich. Can I say that? Yeah, let me say that. <laughs> That's a horrible visual, dude. <laughs> it, it was bad. It was bad. 
but it was just that game unlike others and i'm not gonna say any names chad who was just projecting this is just who they are i said no no even in this game there was some takeaways like what the defense did in the second half that are parts of building blocks so but having said all that man i'm heartened i'm heartened to know that you've come around on this on this thing and uh but i i don't want you to get too far out ahead of your skis so i'm gonna have to just like i had to reel you back three four weeks ago when the sky was falling i'm gonna reel you back in a little bit this week man and so when we get back together when we commiserate the next time we'll be talking about the k-state game and not you going out professing conference championships and all that stuff not quite yet chad I, I said, I said, compete for a conference championship. I didn't say they were going to be conference champions. The team up top is on the buff schedule, Texas Tech. BYU and Iowa State, number two and number three in this conference, are not on the buff schedule. So uh, this is a bit of a complicated path to the top. But as we saw this last weekend in college football, crazy shit happens. Woo! So get yourself ready for that. Woo! Vandy? Vandy? Vandy. Vandy? Vandy was like, oh, you guys talking about kicking us out of the SEC? We'll show you about kicking us out of the SEC. <laughs> How about that? How about that? Yeah. All right, man. Well, uh, we CJ and I will get together later this week and, and do a podcast previewing the bus game against Kansas State. Uh, thank you for tuning in to another episode of Black and Gold Brothers Podcast. And once again, Journey Spice. If you want to make your take your cooking game to the next level, get the Journey Spice. No salt in their spice blends, their seasoning blends. That way you can use as much for flavor as you want and salt to taste. It's a tremendous way of going about it. They do a wonderful job. Hit them up on Amazon.com. Use the code 20FIELDGOAL to get 20% off your order of Journey Spice. Uh, that's it for us. We'll see you guys in a couple of days. Peace. Peace.